This is the uh, Queen Anne's County Planning Commission special meeting regarding the comprehensive plan update for 2021. And let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I forgot to say today is Thursday, June 24th, 2021. Uh, we're going to start with Wallace Montgomery. Since I don't have any other one, things on the agenda. <laughs> Great. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Good with Wallace Montgomery, uh, planning ma uh, project manager for the you talk comprehensive louder, plan or cool. project. Yes. Closer. <laughs> um, and with me is Ray Moravec. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and uh, today uh, we are here to discuss the uh, community facilities and environment chapters of the uh, of the plan. Uh, before we get into the content that's on the screen, uh, we just wanted to uh, provide a brief update that um, we are working with county staff to review the water resources analysis um, in more depth, and uh, we will be discussing that with you all um, more so at the next meeting in conjunction with the land use chapter discussion. Um, okay. <laughs> just double, double checking that note there. All right, so um, uh, just to give a brief overview of some recent outreach efforts, uh, we did hold our last special topic workshop uh, earlier in this month, uh, and that focused on land use and priority preservation. We were really lucky to have, uh, to be able to um, both host that virtually as well as have an in-person component and had a really great turnout um, for that at the, the Sudlersville Fire Hall. Uh, so the summaries for uh, that meeting, uh, all of the, the comments um, and things like that will be included in your packet for the July meeting. Um, so you can look for, for that in the next, uh, the next few days. We do want to say quickly thank you to the fire hall as well. They were very nice and supportive in helping us with uh, getting things set. So um, oh, good. it was a nice venue. Uh, we've also uh, held two additional technical committee meetings, uh, again, focusing on land use and priority preservation, uh, as well as the implementation chapters of the plan. Uh, since last month, we've actually, uh, or I guess earlier this month, we've actually had quite a few people um, uh, asked to be added to our update list. Uh, so that's uh, great to hear that people are still um, wanting to be added and get additional information. Um, so you can see here we've we've had increases in the total number of subscribers, um, the total users, and we've actually had a pretty significant jump in the number of total page views um, for the plan. So that's you know, great to see that um, people are making use of that, um, of that resource. Um, and as you, you can see uh, with this chart here, uh, we have our 15th question of the week, which it has a focus on agriculture. Um, and that was uh, tied with the priority preservation discussion that we had at the special topic workshop. Uh, so we are still accepting responses uh, to that. Um, and we've received 37 so far. Um, so if anyone uh, still has those surveys uh, and wants to provide that information to us to be included, uh, please get that to us as soon as possible. Uh, and similar to how we've uh, done in the past, this is just a brief overview of some of those questions of the week um, that we have had. Uh, this one asked about the, the top factors that are important uh, to people when they are deciding to visit a park or recreation facility. Uh, and the, the top responses were that facilities are, the facilities are well-maintained, they are safe and secure, and that they are convenient uh, to the user. Uh, there were also a number of um, facilities that were highlighted of um, those respondents that they plan to use in the next year. Uh, the top responses there were the Cross Island Trail, the Terrapin Nature Area, the Mattapeak Clubhouse and Public Beach, and public uh, landings and boat launches.
And then we also asked a question about um, the most important role that the county should play in promoting effective management and conservation of water resources, including things like wetlands and um, floodplains, streams, um, and other water bodies, things like that. Uh, the responses that we received uh, were to steer new development away from areas that would impact those waters and toward less sensitive areas, uh, coordinating and reviewing local plans to make sure they're consistent with land use and environmental protection goals, um, using uh, money to buy lands or development rights to protect endangered water resources and improving zoning and other regulations. Uh, and then uh, going back as a reminder, um, uh, <laughs> The, some of the results from the community survey that was uh, that was done um, at the beginning of the project. Uh, the survey asked about the importance of a number of factors to quality of life in the county, um, and uh, these responses are particular to uh, community facilities and those items that are found in that chapter. Uh, so, as you, so as you can see here, uh, county services like the Department of Public Works, fire, police services um, had over 75% um, of respondents say that those were important to quality of life. Um, and then recreational resources, open space, and youth programs all um, had about 50% of uh, people responding saying that those are very important. Um, and then transitioning slightly to the importance of uh, various community facilities to future development, um, we again saw that um, uh, the majority of people thought that having um, parks and access to green spaces was very important, uh, along with sustainability and energy efficiency. Uh, and then again, close to 75% of respondents highlighted that smart technologies such as Wi-Fi um, were very important uh, to, to future development within the county. When asked about the role that uh, county officials should play um, when, uh, when asked about the um, emergency services facilities, um, the uh, respondents um, felt that that should be encouraged um, um, as well as uh, green technology. Uh, and then the local impacts of development, uh, this is how development has impacted the various facilities uh, that are listed. Uh, and as you can see here, um, while some um, items have had more of a positive um, uh, impact, such as access to health care, um, others uh, were noted as having really having had little change, such as uh, child care facilities and energy supplies. Uh, and then um, we've got fewer responses on the negative side of this spectrum, um, which is which is um, always good to good to hear. Um, but there are, uh, you know, between say 15 and 20 percent of those uh, respondents um, uh, saying that there's been uh, a negative impact due to development that has occurred over the last 10 years or so. And then that same question about um, uh, the role of officials uh, related to the environment um, here, uh, the overwhelming majority, uh, about 99% of respondents, um, or I'm sorry, 86% were saying that they um, they thought that uh, county officials should encourage environmental and open space preservation, um, while there was a, a smaller contingent that um, that thought uh, they should remain neutral on that issue. Um, and then again, here we're seeing a little bit more of the um, either little change or um, negative uh, impacts of development on environmental quality, um, but still recognizing that there have been efforts to uh, keep environmental, environmental quality high um, when development does occur. Okay, so. I was going to say, so that's the quick <laughs> overview sort of of what we've been seeing, hearing through the surveys and that side of it. Those are the questions uh, really related to these chapters we're talking about here and, and, and where we're going. So just curious if there's any questions or comments on that outreach effort today before we actually get into the chapters themselves today. Looks like we're, we've got a green light. Um, and uh, those uh, 
special topic workshops, the last one that we held, that wrapped up our um, our series of planned workshops. Uh, so we, we did want to make sure to stress that while we don't have any additional um, visioning or special topic workshops planned for the public, um, of course, these planning commission meetings are always open to the public. And as we continue to progress through um, through the development uh, and revisions of the chapters and get closer to opening the public comment period, um, there will still be many additional uh, opportunities for the public to weigh in, provide comment, and ask questions about the, the plan. Um, but of course, as always, the sooner those comments um, come into us, the sooner that we can look into, look into them and begin to address them um, as the, the drafts roll out. And of course, the website uh, stays active mm -hmm. with the questions as well as opportunities for them to uh, review the materials that have been presented and any comments um, as well. They have the opportunity there to submit comments um, on any of the materials from before to the current ones. So we encourage that strongly. Uh, so we will uh, just go ahead and dive right into the uh, chapter three, which is on community facilities and services. Uh, and similarly to the other chapters uh, in the plan, uh, the, the similar items that are included are the vision, key goal, uh, key issues, themes, um, guiding principles and legislation, uh, as well as some strategies and actions. Um, there's a brief overview of uh, public input related to this particular topic area. And then when we get into specific content of the chapter, there are discussions about the county's uh, governance and administration. Um, everything from the overall government structure to uh, an overview of elected officials and boards and commissions, uh, county departments, uh, and, and the, the court system, so those major um, uh, governance uh, features that are found within the county. Uh, there's uh, then a uh, discussion of public safety, um, everything from em emergency services, uh, law enforcement, the fire departments, uh, and the detention centers. Uh, and then a, uh, a discussion of utilities, um, which includes uh, the excuse me, the traditional utilities that we think of, such as water, sewer, stormwater, uh, but then also looking at uh, solid waste and recycling, as well as broadband. Um, uh, and um, we we definitely wanted to to stress here that um, while the water, sewer, stormwater topics are discussed in this chapter. Um, it is, it, it, those are discussed more so um, in, in different chapters. This is just uh, giving that broader overview of them as a utility um, uh, in general. Uh, the chapter then uh, has a discussion on uh, education and the various public uh, facilities that are found within the county, uh, similarly to uh, the library facilities uh, that are found within the county, uh, and then a discussion on parks and recreation. While we have been uh, compiling this chapter uh, and working through some of those revisions, um, we have um, been referencing a number of resources to help with that update. Uh, everything from the uh, broadband strategic plan that was developed last year um, to uh, solid waste plan, uh, the hazard mitigation plan, uh, some various reports uh, from different agencies um, to capital improvement programs and facility master plans uh, and reports uh, from various agencies at the at the state level. Uh, so here we wanted to give a uh, um, a little bit of a um, more detailed overview of the uh, topics that are covered within this chapter. Uh, and one of those is the expansion of the emergency services discussion um, from what uh, you all saw in the, the first draft of this chapter. Uh, we uh, had um, interviews with the uh, Department of Emergency Services and were uh, able to collect some additional information and provide um, additional um, uh, discussions on a variety of topic areas um, from their communications, um, uh, emergency medical services, special operations, uh, fire marshal's office and support services to the sheriff's office, Maryland State Police, uh, the volunteer fire departments and the detention center. Uh, so really the 
The goal of this section was to uh, not only describe uh, these various resources and the services that they provide to the county, uh, but then also to highlight um, some of those areas where um, they were seeing um, uh, needs or um, different planning efforts um, that they had in part undertaken. Sorry. <laughs> Just took a breath, sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, so again, uh, the discussion on utilities, uh, we did um, broaden those discussions slightly, uh, but the, we are still pointing to uh, both the environmental chapter and the water resources analysis for more detailed information. Um, and again, as, um, as discussed, we'll be talking more about the water resources analysis um, at, our, at our next meeting um, with you all, more in conjunction with the uh, land, use, uh, land use chapter. Um, the section on broadband and telecommunication needs, um, I think this is something that we've, we've been really hearing from the start with our visioning sessions that um, there is a need for more consistent um, uh, high-speed internet access, uh, broadband, um, things of that nature. Uh, so this section uh, provided some more information about the establishment of the Broadband Advisory Council, uh, as well as the strategic plan that they, uh, that they developed um, and identified unserved and underserved areas of the county where these uh, resources ha are, are not uh, currently provided. Uh, and then we were uh, we were also fortunate to to speak to um, the the staff liaison to that council um, and to discuss the various grant applications that they've been working on to uh, try to uh, secure funding to help provide additional infrastructure um, in those uh, unserved and underserved areas of the county. Um, so they've they have been. Um, successful in part. Um, I think that the, the, the uh, COVID um, uh, pandemic um, impacted that, that uh, a little bit, um, but they are um, looking forward to um, moving forward with some of those additional efforts um, over the next few years. Um, and then, of course, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, most, if not all of you, have been hearing about the, the president's new um, inf infrastructure and bills that have come out. So there are some additional um, funding opportunities there, um, particularly for uh, rur more rural broadband um, telecommunications. So um, certainly once those um, opportunities are more solidified, that's that's definitely something uh, to, to keep an eye on to uh, try to move forward with. Um, uh, getting some additional funding to help put that uh, infrastructure in place where it's needed. Where did this map come from? Uh, that was actually out of the uh, broadband strategic plan. Because it's not accurate. I mean, the top two and a half miles of Ken Allen has no broadband, or no, no um, internet access whatsoever. Um, we can we can certainly look into that. Um, that was I'm if not entirely sure the uh, methodology. Yeah, if that's not on there, I can't imagine that the bottom half, bottom part has it. Either. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We will we'll check with that check source and that group. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. Nope. You still have a green light. <laughs> um, so um, uh, one of the important topics, uh, discussions related to community facilities is that of um, uh, the adequate public facilities ordinance and, and what, that, what that means. Um, uh, and that's really uh, standards and criteria that have been put in place for various public facilities uh, to ensure that there are um, there are adequate capacities to um, uh, for any uh, development that is occurring. Um, it helps to identify uh, different improvement programs as well as acceptable levels of surface service uh, and then um, identifies uh, or in part helps to inform uh, capital improvement programs uh, and where some of those additional uh, facility needs may be. Um, and uh, 
there are um, additional discussions about this, uh, definitely when we get down to looking at uh, information related to the, uh, the public schools uh, and their capacities and enrollment projections. So we will um, uh, get to that piece of it in, in just a moment. Um, uh, and then, of course, um, uh, that uh, discussion ties in very closely to capacity of um, water, sewer, and things of that nature, which, again, we will uh, be discussing a little later on. Um, this chapter uh, sort of gets rounded out with a discussion on uh, parks and recreation. Uh, and um, similarly to how the uh, the county has to update the comprehensive plan at least every 10 years, uh, the county is also required to update its land preservation, parks, and recreation plan um, every five. I always <laughs> just have to pause to, to get that acronym out. Um, but that update is actually uh, currently uh, currently being worked on. Um, instructions from the state uh, on that or some additional guidance uh, just came out within the last month or two. Uh, so that's something that the county's um, Parks and Recreation Department are, are working on uh, to um, move through that update. Uh, so that's something that we uh, we are going to be coordinating um, with them to determine the, the best location for um, some particular pieces of information. Um, typically, or, or in the past, uh, the LPPRP has been the location for more of the um, inventories of different resources uh, and things of that nature, um, whereas the Comp plan is uh, a place where there have been more detailed discussions of um, preservation lands and programs of, and, and things like that. Um, and uh, we are just uh, at this point working on that coordination effort um, to make sure that um, the information that we are uh, including in, in, in both of those plans are um, coordinated and uh, makes sense uh, the level of detail that's been being provided in each. Um, and then, um, let's see, again, um, uh, jumping back into that discussion of um, the school capacities um, and things of that nature, we did want to just pull out a few, um, a few tables um, that are uh, similar to those that are in the chapter, but just to um, sort of highlight the information that we are seeing uh, when looking at that um, that information. Uh, so the, the state rated capacity is the, um, the maximum number of students uh, that can be reasonably accommodated in those facilities um, without significantly hampering delivery of the educational program. Um, and this is often the metric that is used to determine if uh, the particular schools are over capacity, um, helping to ensure that the facilities aren't overburdened by any new growth that may, um, that may be proposed. Uh, so back in 2015, the, um, uh, the county uh, public schools, um, in conjunction with the Maryland Department of Planning, uh, reviewed and provided updates to those state-rated capacities for all of the elementary schools um, based on the number and classifications of uses for each classroom space. Um, that same or, or similar procedure is currently being done for uh, or I'm sorry, um, the, the last time that th that was done for middle and uh, um, high schools or secondary schools um, were uh, revised back in August of 2001. So that again is um, pretty up, pretty outdated. Um, so they are looking at um, revising those uh, currently and we'll have those um, results uh, coming out uh, at some point in the future. But really what we're trying to highlight with this table, um, those uh, schools that are highlighted in orange are ones that have already exceeded 100% of that uh, state rated capacity based on the 2019-2020 uh, school year's enrollment figures. Uh, so um, those two schools, uh, Kennard Elementary and Kent Island High, um, are, are showing um, you know, students above those, above that um, uh, capacity there. And then 
um, Centerville Elementary and Queen Anne's County High School are ones that are um, above 90%. So that's uh, just something to um, that everyone's going to be keeping an eye on just to, um, um, you know, try to keep those numbers from um, getting into that sort of orange level. Uh, and then when we look at that, um, uh, just looking at the public school enrollment projections, um, this is done um, every every year uh, between the uh, the county and um, working with again the Maryland Department of Planning to develop these projection numbers. Um, so here we um, the there are uh, annual projections for each school year um, from the. 21, 22 school year all the way through uh, 29, 30. Um, and what this is showing um, is that, um, you know, the the enrollment in general um, is is somewhat varied depending on the school, which, you know, makes sense because of the location um, and, and how those are being impacted. Um, in general, um, when we look out to uh, the 24, 25 timeframe, um, so that's in about five years, um, these projections are uh, are saying that there, um, there will probably be about 45 new students total um, in the in the district. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, you know, differences for sure, um, with the middle schools showing about um, 50 fewer students, whereas the high schools are showing 90 more students, um, so balancing out. Uh, and then when we look uh, 10 years in the future at that 2930 uh, school year, we're seeing that there's they're actually projecting a an enrollment drop of um, 84 students. Um, again, um, you know, seeing that more so at the elementary and middle school level, um, whereas the high school is um, uh, projected to increase um, by by 38 by 38 students. So you meant by that was decreasing by 74, not 84. I'm sorry. The the total was actually 84 when you look at oh, both okay. the middle, yeah. high, <laughs> and uh, elementary together. And I think one of the things to point out there too is um, I know when I looked at this, I was looking at the last slide where you show which schools had capacity issues or not, and you do see here, like Kent Island High School, still showing an increase. You know, of eight to six percent over these future time frames, where you're already close to capacity. Same thing you see, like um, even like Graysonville Elementary, you see the larger increase there that will feed into that down the road. So, well, Ken Island, we're already over capacity, correct? Right, and that's why I still sort of highlight that you're still seeing some of that growth and demand will be coming in the future in that versus some of the others. So, those are things to be looking at as we're looking at the trends here with the uh, the schools and capacity issues. Um, and, and of course, as mentioned with the, the new um, uh, state rated capacity numbers coming out at, at some point in the um, near future, um, that will, of course, have a, a, an impact on the, the previous slide and what those, um, what those numbers look like. Um, and of course, since this is an ex since the, uh, the enrollment projections are an exercise that's undertaken every year, um, the school district is able to, um, you know, keep, keep an eye on these and, um, directly correlate, um, uh, some efforts through their capital improvements program to um, in part address uh, some of those issues. Um, there's already um, quite a few um, items uh, in that uh, capital improvement program um, that have been identified. Um, so some of the more um, uh, larger larger projects that um, have the potential to impact this issue in particular have been highlighted in the uh, in the draft of this chapter. Um, so with that, are, are there any questions or comments about the um, uh, community facilities and services chapter? Just a question, one clarification. Uh, you mentioned the state and federal funding, you know, opportunities that come. Is your report going to talk about any of the strings that are attached to that funding uh, or just talk about the fact that these are resources? Uh, to tap into in, into the future, and, and by that I mean sometimes the state has a different agenda than perhaps Queen Anne's County, or certainly the feds have a different agenda than most everybody else. 
So, I mean, it would it would uh, be a situation here as to are those things that you'll you know identify or just reference that they should be followed up on. We haven't gotten um, too in depth about any particular uh, any particular programs at this point. More so. Um, um, mentioning them as a potential resource um, since we haven't done um, too much of an analysis about um, the specific funding programs that are that are out there for a variety of different um, topic areas um, it's it's difficult to say just you know more generally um, what eligibilities there might be or or specifics it's really for the awareness uh, and just, understanding just, but knowing chatting, these are chatting things. about awareness yeah. not necessarily going to specifics mm -hmm. exactly. i'll defer to amy and her team on some of the other things <laughs> exactly yes we're trying to put the awareness out there that there are opportunities but as with everything there's a process and another layer that has to be gone through on those specifics thank you Anything else at this at this point? All right. Cool. Go ahead and transition into the environmental uh, resources chapter. Actually, Lauren, I'm going to real quick sure. before we think, just for a general understanding, and I just want to put it out there from the uh, public side as well, uh, with the way the um, update is laid out. Um, you'll see that that last chapter was chapter three, uh, which is really where we're getting in and setting that foundation and people understanding the different services, resources, et cetera, that the county has so that they'll then see as we get into these next chapters when we talk about environmental land use, others in more detail, that shows some of the different groups and organizations that are involved with that and then how they play a role and what it means for these next few chapters. So I, I just want to put it out there because I think from a public perspective, as people look at these plans, sometimes it's easy to jump back into chapter seven or eight when it comes to a specific resource, but there is a context in the flow of there's a relationship between these different chapters, depending on the service and the organization that might be helping um, fulfill those needs. So I just want to make that aware from a public perspective. Uh, and it, within the environmental resources chapter, uh, again, similar to the others, uh, there there's the uh, updated vision, um, key issues and themes, uh, some guiding principles and legislation, uh, strategies and actions, uh, some identified best management practices, tools and techniques, uh, and then again, some um, uh, a summary of the public input heard particular to this to this topic area uh, the the main content uh, in this chapter uh, is the discussion of sensitive areas and natural resources uh, everything from streams and their buffers uh, the critical area wetlands uh, floodplain and flood hazards uh, species habitats, uh, different conservation lands, hazard mitigation, and uh, and climate change, um, and then uh, a discussion of water resources. Uh, and again, this um, uh, this uh, discussion of water, wastewater, and stormwater is tied uh, directly to the water resources analysis um, that will be that will be discussing more in depth um, at our at our next meeting. Um, but here. Um, there, this uh, section sort of gives the um, the overall results um, of the analysis um, that is done. So um, here, there uh, there will um, be be tweaks to this based on um, you know the the continued um, uh, collaboration with county staff on the review of that analysis. Um, um, but we'll be uh, discussing that piece of it um, in in uh, just a few moments. Um, and then another section in this chapter um, is that of mineral resources, um, and that is uh, a required component um, by the state to include uh, to include that uh, that discussion uh, within the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, as I'm sure you all can imagine, there are quite a few um, resources out there uh, related to uh, the environment. Um, so this this is certainly not a complete list, um, but any any smaller, and I don't think anyone would be able to read it. Um, but everywhere from uh, the county's um, uh, water and sewerage plan to um, the, again, the land preservation parks and recreation plan, uh, hazard mitigation plan, um, the nuisance flood plan, um, the uh, the WIP narrative and milestones update, um, uh, other planning efforts that have been undertaken, such as the, the sea level rise and coastal vulnerability assessment, um, uh, various um, uh, efforts done at the state level, uh, including the um, the state's climate change action plan, um, their sea level rise projections, um, and then also some uh, reports by uh, some uh, uh, other uh, agencies, uh, such as the Corsica River Con Conservatory Report, um, the University of Maryland has put out some uh, additional information about a variety of um, these resources. Uh, and then, of course, um, looking at both uh, or all of the um, county, state, and federal laws and regulations and policies um, and how they um, um, how they regulate uh, these, these various resources um, and how those impact the county. Um, in their um, in their activities. Uh, so first, um, we we have had a few comments come up um, um, in the in the I guess framework of um, when when we did have the land use and um, priority preservation special topic workshop. Um, <coughs> some of the attendees were expecting to have more of a discussion about some of the other uh, types of conservation areas. Um, and we, we really wanted to clarify that um, between the, the definitions for sensitive areas and those for priority preservation areas are found in state code. Um, and so we've uh, tried to incorporate um, those, all of the pieces that um, sort of have a holistic look at um, environmental resources and their protection, um, agricultural protection, you know, all of those different um, protection and conservation efforts. It's just a matter of what particular um, area you find them in within the plan. Uh, so for sensitive areas, which are the ones that are discussed within this environmental chapter, um, those are the resources um, such as streams and buffers, the floodplains, um, habitats of threatened endangered species, uh, steep slopes, wetlands, um, things, things of that nature. Um, while we do discuss uh, each of those topic areas, um, there are also um, broadened uh, discussions about um, other natural resources, um, what the county has um, as existing conditions for those resources, um, and then other information about them. Um, so that's taking sort of that broader look at those um, uh, environmental or sensitive areas um, within the county. Um, the priority preservation areas, um, when we talk about that, that's really looking more at the agricultural and forested lands within the county um, and their, uh, their conservation um, and protection. Um, so that component of the discussion, uh, while briefly mentioned in this chapter um, is more fleshed out in the land use section um, because of the, um, uh, again, the protection of those lands and what that means for, um, for example, development um, and things like that. Um, so that that uh, conversation we'll be, um, again, having at the, the July meeting, um, uh, giving a uh, some more information about those topics. Um, but just because we have had uh, some of that, some of those questions come up, um, that is an area where we will be um, making that um, a little bit more clear um, at the uh, the upfront pieces of the plan, so in the um, introductory chapter, I'm just really trying to spell out where the, this particular information can be found um, for those that are looking for it. Uh, 
um, a, another section um, that we have uh, included in this um, in this update uh, is that of hazard mitigation. Uh, and while um, some of those do relate to the um, sensitive areas and those discussions, um, this is this is definitely something that uh, we wanted to um, provide more detail um, and make it um, a little bit more apparent how that relates to. Um, the environmental resources in general um, and the the county's uh, plan in general. Uh, so um, a, a few years ago, uh, the county undertook an effort to update its um, multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. And of course, that goes into much more detail about all of these various topic areas. Uh, but we wanted to highlight um, those that are um, much more prevalent in the county or have a higher risk factor. So those discussions were incorporated um, really to provide context for these different um, hazards that the, the county may face um, really at, at any time you know hopefully hopefully we don't but um, uh, you know there there are these are definitely all items that are are on the horizon. Um, and that actually uh, does tie in um, with the discussion on on climate change, um, and um, we've we have stayed away from the discussion of the causes. Um, you know that that can become um, a very political issue or discussion to have. So we are uh, more so focusing on um, the what what's actually happening. So we're already seeing more frequent and heavier uh, precipitation events um, and, and more uh, more frequent um, as well as uh, some rising temperatures um, you know when we when we look back a hundred years um, to to the uh, temperatures of today um, we can see that those are um, you know slightly elevated and um, even a difference of uh, one degree in um, temperature can have a um, um, an extreme impact on um, on what uh, on various aspects, um, um, you know, things like uh, well, one one major one that comes to mind is that of agriculture, uh, how that may impact the the growing season or the types of crops that um, um, that can even be be grown in various areas um, due to the this combination of um, of items. Uh, and then I think one topic area that is. Um, probably discussed a little bit more commonly is that of sea level rise. Um, so again, this section provides some information on um, the uh, projections for uh, what what um, uh, various modeling efforts are sh are uh, predicting the sea level rise would be um, the typical years that that looks at are uh, 2050 and 2100 um, and the um, the uh, feet or meter distance that may change um, due to that sea level rise um, sort of identifying those areas where there are impacts and the types of facilities that may be impacted uh, due to that that um, those rising sea levels. Um, and of course, with uh, so much of the county um, being uh, coastal, you know, that's that is uh, definitely a concern, um, not only for those coastal areas, but then also any of the riverine areas that are impacted by uh, by tidal waters. Um, so, of course, the um, the county did uh, conduct uh, a separate effort to look at sea level rise um, vulnerabilities and things of that nature. Um, so, again, this this component is really pulling in that information um, to um, provide that uh, sort of holistic picture at how um, at environmental resources and um, what we may be seeing in the next 10 to 20 years. I was just, say, just real quick, as give Lauren a brief breath in, in, in presenting is um, a lot of these also are items that when we started this effort earlier and we were talking about what people had interest in, what they see, what may not have been in the 2010 plan, what truly happened over the last 10 years, a lot of these are elements that there has been a lot of activity, a lot of new things, a lot more data. So we're trying to incorporate that as best we can for where things are with this update. If I may, uh, piggyback on that as well as um, to highlight uh, Commissioner Ebersberger's comments earlier. Part of that um, exercise that the county underwent back in 18, 19, I'm looking around the room for nods, something like that, um, 
various representatives of this commission, Department of Public Works, Planning, Parks, Emergency Services, uh, worked with the state uh, through a grant fund um, to not only talk about and digest all that data that you're referencing, but it actually went a step further and outlined funding opportunities, mechanisms, which I think is advantageous to this county because that is often the stumbling block. We have this information that how do we get, how do we connect A to B or Q? Um, and there are specific grant programs, funding avenues that are contained in that document that put us, I think, a step ahead of other counties that were not part of that process because it outlines a step-by-step -step process or at least points out and, and contributes funding opportunities and pathways to get there. And that is a critical step in obtaining that funding is showing that we have invested public resources and public comments and public discussions, uh, and it, it really does um, dramatically increase the diameter of that snowball as it rolls downhill. Uh, so I think that's worth pointing out that it's not just talking about it, uh-oh, in 50 years we're going to be standing in knee-deep water, but that being the case, here's how we can help mitigate community assets and protect our infrastructure. Um, so I'll stop bumbling and mumbling, um, but I, I think that's a major component of this new update in this space, if you will. Uh, so I, again, I compliment the appreciate the uh, ability to participate in that workshop, and I think we're I think it's critically timed for our, the comprehensive plan update as well as uh, to sort of have um, a for a down uh, you know f down horizon view of where we might be and how we may protect ourselves and our communities better. And to, to piggyback on that comment a little bit, um, we've been seeing with a lot of um, other funding sources that are out there that they are beginning to uh, tie those to climate change. So how is a, a potential potentially funded project um, going to incorporate in, incorporate um, those climate change projections, whether it is um, sea level rise or you know one of the one of the other um, issues, um, even even. Um, uh, opportunities that um, are historically much more infrastructure focused, uh, like um, uh, transportation related, we are we are definitely starting to see that become a um, a major part. Um, and so those are things that have to be considered when looking at all of these these different um, these different things. Um, and it really makes sense because you, for example, you don't want to um, put in a new road that's going to be underwater in 50 years, or you know exacerbate problems. Um, you know when you can take those into account now um, and sort of see where things are are going to be um, I, you know it's a, it's a little bit of the crystal ball situation but as much as as much as we can incorporate that into um, our, our various planning efforts and planned um, infrastructure um, you know that's it's definitely more advantageous to sort of get ahead of it than wait for it to become a crisis and address it you know in the in the moment when we are knee deep in water are there any other um, comments or questions at this point? I think you still have a green light. How about if we take a five minute break? All right.
Okay. Um, so the the two bullets that are uh, shown at the end of this list, uh, we've got a couple of slides to help um, with with those discussions. Um, and um, there, there are uh, some members of um, county staff that are present should there be more detailed or technical questions um, mm -hmm. that they're better suited to uh, to answering. Um, so we'll definitely avail ourselves of that uh, that expertise um, if if needed. Uh, so um, one of the uh, topics that um, um, that is uh, prevalent um, when talking about environmental resources is that of um, impervious surfaces um, and and how much coverage those surfaces have uh, within the county. So of course those uh, impervious surfaces are those where the um, uh, basically um, rainwater can't um, seep directly into the ground because of that because of that barrier um, and that that definitely has impacts on um, the the health of the area um, potential flooding implications um, uh, it's tied to uh, regulatory issues um, not only um, for example um, with the amount of uh, coverage that can be on a, a development lot but then also um, uh, there this comes up in different um, uh, permitting um, requirements um, and, and things like that so this is definitely um, one of those areas that's uh, that's important to consider and um, keep at the forefront of the discussions on um, environmental resources and the environment in general uh, so here, um, both the, the, the previous plan um, listed the uh, impervious surface coverages um, in 20, 2008, uh, which is when that um, uh, data layer was developed. Uh, similarly, in 2016, um, there was a, uh, a data layer developed that identified all of those impervious um, surface areas uh, within the county. Uh, and then this uh, this chart here just breaks that down by um, by watershed to to really show that um, you know how much of these uh, different watershed areas are impacted or, or covered by these impervious surfaces. Um, so, um, as you can see, back in 2008, um, there was um, one watershed, uh, Kent Island Bay watershed, that um, had over 10% uh, of its area covered with impervious surfaces. Um, and then the, the Eastern Bay watershed, that was um, right around 9%. Um, so when we get to um, that uh, ten percent number. That's when there there really starts to be um, uh, dramatic effects for the watershed, um, just for for the health of those watersheds. Um, so the fact that there are, um, you know, the smaller numbers um, are are definitely better in terms of that watershed health component. Um, and when we when we look at those, um, when we go forward to the twenty sixteen uh, coverage numbers, those two uh, watersheds are, um, you know, they've they've seen an increase, um, and um, both are now over that ten percent um, that ten percent number. Um, when we are just uh, looking at the the change um, in that uh, eight eight year period or so. Um, overall, it uh, based on the the statistics and how this uh, this data worked out, um, it, it appears that um, there's been almost a 25% increase in the amount of um, of coverage, um, and again, that varies um, greatly depending on the actual watershed that you're in. Um, so this is um, again certainly something to to keep in mind as. Um, you know any any new development um, um, may occur, or um, just basically any surfaces are um, put in place that would impact the ability for um, that rainwater to penetrate into the ground directly. I just have a question: How does it decrease? Um, there are a lot more practices and other things that have been going on within this side of the environmental side. So um, if there is a redevelopment opportunity, say you have a place that had a large parking lot um, and they redevelop and uh, minimize the amount of parking and add in stormwater or best management really? practices, that is a way to reduce the acreage if you put in impervious pavement. Um, you know, there, there's pervious pavement, I should say, um, you know, that are practices in place now 
um, really over the last 15 to 20 years that are becoming commonplace. Those are all methods and tools that are being used. I thought they still didn't count. Huh? I thought they still didn't count. No, they count when you count to the overall total impervious surfaces. It does help get to that reduction when you're doing that, because you know, it, like I said, if you're taking a site that has you know a large parking lot where it was with no um, stormwater or no treatment pits or anything like that, you've removed pavement and put in green space. That all goes to, and, and counts towards that reduction in impervious surfaces. <laughs> And, and just to clarify, the, the way that, for example, the zoning code may define impervious coverage may be different than these figures, um, just just due to the methodology or the, the definitions that are used. Um, so um, I think that's, you know, in part, um, while the the zoning regulations may um, may uh, include some items that would be considered um, impervious, um, such as some of those um, uh, those BMPs, um, they may be different, calculated differently for the purposes of this data set. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moving on to, um, I think the, the big, um, uh, topic area uh, for today, the big discussion area, and that is uh, in regard to uh, sewer capacity um, and uh, what those uh, what those limitations um, uh, may mean for the county. Uh, so working with the, um, or, or I should say, the, the Department of Public Works provided us with this information, um, which... Uh, neither one of those guys are here. Can we ask them to come in? Steve he should be. He, he agreed to speak to him. Yeah. On me and, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, this uh, this table is is really showing um, that green line is um, sort of that that starting estimated existing capacity, um, and then of course. Um, uh, different um, types of development that have been approved um, have allocated capacities. Um, so that next block uh, shows that between residential, commercial, and multi-use commitments, um, there are um, you know upwards of um, you know more than 1,700 um, you know either dwelling units or vacant lots that have already received this capacity allocation. Um, but when you take that component out, um, we're left with about um, uh, that 233,000 uh, gallons per day. Uh, but then there, um, as you all know, that there is the um, failing septic areas uh, in Southern Kent Island. So a portion of that capacity has been reserved uh, to um, Help with that uh, with that situation and the the conversion to um, uh, public uh, public sewers, um, and then there's also been a um, a uh, portion of that capacity that has been reserved for um, uh, future commercial and institutional use. So when we look at all of these um, all of these figures and um, looking at the um, the estimated remaining uh, capacity we're actually already seeing a, a deficit based on what has already been um, planned for or allocated uh, so this has a direct impact on uh, the amount of growth that can occur, uh, the amount of new development, the amount of uh, redevelopment of, of some types. Um, so this is a, a very important discussion for, um, for us to have one to make sure that everybody realizes that um, and that and, and then two to um, uh, you know work working to develop a strategy to try to address that um, uh, that capacity limitation um, now as you as you can see here um, those you know um, seventeen hundred or so uh, residential units are ones that are um, you know to be developed in in the future so there is still 
there are still those development opportunities. It's just that um, those in um, that have not already uh, received that capacity allocation, um, those are going to be limited. And um, we we want to make sure that any capacity that does remain is um, being put to the most appropriate use um, for the county um, and uh, taking into account also uh, other um, uh, facility limitations um, such as the you know school capacity if we're already seeing um, schools in some areas um, that are over or over capacity or reaching capacity, um, we want to, um, you know, encourage development to happen elsewhere. Um, so within the um, within the plan um, and in talking with um, uh, county staff and the technical committee, um, it has been the recommendation that um, really the any um, additional growth that uh, does occur is uh, really directed to the um, the towns that have the capacity to accept um, to accept that growth, um, and that um, you know outside of these uh, developments that have already been um, approved and have the commitments, um, it's it's really going to be difficult to uh, or difficult or um, uh, not likely for the, that um, additional uh, development to to occur in the future. Um, so this is this is definitely. Where do um, we stand? Where do we stand on the on the Ken Island? Since they seem to be, that seems to be the um, the biggest abuser. Where do we stand on them getting access? As far as want to um, introduce yourself, Steve. oh, thank you, uh, Steve Cahoon. I'm the uh, public facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Department of Public Works, okay. and um, um, where we stand is is the um, ten years ago when we were doing the um, the comp plan update, there were a lot of variables in the development community of what was going to happen and how things were going to happen. And things like the four, the four Seasons Project, um, Southern Kent Island Sewer, um, those were questions at the time. And, and over this last 10-year planning period, uh, we know how those have turned out. We've made commitments to those projects as well as a number of other projects such as Perry's Retreats, a number of apartment buildings, um, a number of commercial uses, um, Bay uh, uh, Bay Manor, an ap apartment building there on Pier 1. So there's a number of commitments that have been made um, over time, as well as the reservation for the full build out of Southern Kent Island. And so we've been uh, closely monitoring the flows at the sewer treatment plant, as well as the allocation distributed. But at this point, as, um, as Lauren has pointed out, um, the commitments that have been made um, are basically take, um, uh, reach the capacity at the three million gallons of the capacity of the plant. So we need to continue to monitor um, the flows that that come in. Um, but right now, as we're looking at public policy decisions and how, how to move forward, we really have to consider that the um, sewer treatment plant, the capacity of the sewer treatment plant, has been committed, and that the um, other um, infrastructure improvements uh, that are accounted for in the APFO, water, roads, and schools. You know, we've, over the last 10 year planning period, we've um, committed a lot of that capacity, and we have a very, a, a much thinner line of capacity uh, for any future growth, residential growth. Is this number countywide, or is this talking about Ken Island here in your capacities? This this number or the the um, the sewer numbers are for the sewer service area, um, which is generally our growth areas that run from Kent Island to um, the the emergency room in Graysonville. So that corridor along um, 50 Stevensville, Chester, Kent Naris, Graysonville is the sewer service area. Um, the, the, those growth areas make up the sewer service area. So we're not talking about Centerville or Southernville at all. No, no, actually. Um, 
you know, trying to direct growth to those, the towns and, um, you know, the town county component of the comp plan, um, it reinforces, you know, trying to direct, uh, growth to the incorporated towns and the towns that have, uh, some sewer capacity, um, would, would be, you know, good areas to, to direct future growth. That's a key point that we want to highlight as part of this because it relates between not only the discussion here within the environmental chapter, but also the discussion we'll be having when we talk about the land use and others because there is that relationship between those areas and how it interacts and, um, you know, from everything from the sewer capacity, adequate public facilities, all those um, have to be looked at collectively in those different chapters. Will there, to that point, uh, Mr. Moravec, will there be um, a chart similar to this that addresses those, you know, uh, treatment plants, towns with capacity so that this board and future members of this board can say, oh, we should slow down here and maybe redirect development here or encourage uh, by whatever means um, so that we don't just sort of say, Southern Kent Island, you're bringing us all down, right? There are development opportunities. There are um, um, workarounds to these constraints that we have. Um, it's in here. Is it? Right there. I think it's right there. So there, there is yeah. that. Uh, there is a uh, table currently in this uh, in this chapter. Um, it's uh, oh, got table five it. dash seven. Yep, yep. Um, and this is. Um, Definitely want to make clear this this is subject to change. This is still part of the information that we are um, that we are coordinating with um, uh, with um, Steve and the rest of the public works um, as well as the the towns to make sure that that is um, the the most up to date information. So with any um, changes that occur with that water resources analysis, um, the any resulting information that's either found in this chapter um, or going back to the community uh, facilities chapter where that introduction is held um, will reflect any of those changes. Thank you. I like having Lauren answer the questions for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, were there any additional questions or comments on this particular topic area? Okay. Um, so as we as we move forward with um, completing development of that, um, that will the the sections um, this along with that water resources analysis will include. Um, uh, strategies that in part have been um, mentioned uh, this morning um, and just to really make clear what those strategies are um, for the, uh, the the planning period moving forward um, and um, as Ray mentioned a lot of these uh, these topic areas really do tie together um, and relate to one another um, so that um, the, the the current um, sewer and school capacity limitations will of course impact um, future development and redevelopment activities um, and again um, additional specifics will be identified and we'll have that um, uh, further discussion on them as part of the um, the land use discussion um, and and uh, how those those two pieces relate to one another um, and um, and as I as I mentioned, um, so not only the uh, water resources, environmental resources, and community facilities, but these may have um, impacts on other sections of the plan, which you've um, already uh, seen the initial draft. So um, we will um, we will make sure that um, any resulting changes that come from this are um, accurately reflected throughout the plan um, so that um, there is that clear picture of what these impacts mean to the various areas. Um, and just on, on that note, um, our next uh, workshop planned uh, with you is uh, scheduled for your July 8th meeting. Um, so then uh, we'll be discussing that land use chapter, uh, which again includes the priority preservation uh, topic, uh, which again is that agricultural and, and forest land um, uh, preservation piece. Uh, as well as a discussion on the, the general um, implementation chapter. So that's the one that sort of 
um, takes all of the, uh, the background information and analysis that have occurred in the previous chapters and tries to wrap it up sort of in a nice little package um, and lays out a, um, a plan of action for the, uh, the, the next um, uh, period moving forward. Um, and then again, as, as we've mentioned, um, that will also include the information on um, the water resources analysis for, um, for review and discussion. And with that, I um, wanted to uh, just open it up if there are any general comments or questions um, that, that, you, that you had. Does the board have any questions? Comments? Thomas? Okay. So we're good. But now we will open up for public comment. Uh, Frank DiGiellinardo? Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. And public comment is limited to what, three minutes? Okay. Frank DiGiellinardo, uh, president of the Corsica River Conservancy. Uh, you all uh, should have our letter that we sent in advance. Uh, but I would like to take the opportunity to uh, summarize some of the, the key points of that. Um, number one is that, um, you know, our feeling and what we heard overwhelmingly in participating in the various uh, public sessions was that the overall community vision that's currently in the comp plan uh, would be very difficult to improve upon. Uh, the sentiment, uh, on the other hand, that we also heard and we believe is that uh, there's work to be done in terms of implementing that vision and assuring uh, that it's uh, attained and maintained. And what we tried to do, point out in the letter, are some of the ways maybe to think about that. Um, you know, uh, what, what does that vision look like in quantitative terms? Uh, if we're talking about land use, uh, maybe specific targets, specific goals are, are worth including in uh, your planning approach, um, such as, um, you know, it's been mentioned uh, keeping uh, Route 301 rural and scenic, um, assuring that our agricultural lands remain no less than a certain percentage of the total acreage in, in the county, um, to work to, uh, to protect a certain percentage of lands overall, and that there be no net loss of forested lands, things like that. Um, similarly, with uh, gro growth allocation, um, maybe using some more uh, quantitative factors to monitor its uh, use, these critical decisions that you all make. Um, where are you in growth allocation? Is growth allocation being aimed at uh, more public versus private needs? It's a very limited resource. Um, and impervious surface. Uh, you heard some discussion about that. It's a real hot spot for us. Um, you know, I couldn't help but think when I was looking at the data that you were presented uh, with regard to schools. And you can see pretty clearly there what the status is, where it's going, and what you all need to do or be, be mindful of. It, impervious surface, you know, it's not like uh, educating our kids, obviously. but. Um, it is extremely important. Um, there was a little bit of talk there about, uh, you mentioned uh, reducing uh, impervious surface. The opportunities to reduce impervious surface are extremely limited. Once it's paved, it's paved for the most part. Uh, we've got uh, tremendous um, technologies now in terms of best management practice to, re to minimize uh, the uh, uh, you know, stormwater effects. However, um, science has shown that, you know, there is that critical zone, 5%, and then you get to 10%. And after that, there's very little you can do to actually restore a watershed. So, you know, that data that is currently, that you've been presented, is five years old. Uh, the county needs up-to-date uh, data on impervious surface by watershed and development needs to be looked at 
not only in terms of the plethora of things that you all need to be concerned about, all the code, the regulations, et cetera, but in terms of what is happening on a watershed basis because that's the way the system works. Um, so we just encourage you to do that. Uh, you know, it, it can be done. There's some counties that have uh, embarked on watershed planning, and we very much recommend that. And then the final point there about, um, you know, the plan is the plan, but we've got uh, these um, uh, chartered uh, municipalities that have their plans, and, you know, unless there's a cohesion between the, the county and uh, the town plans, then the uh, overall comprehensive plan means a, means a heck of a lot less. Thank you for the opportunity to Thank comment. Thank you. Next on the agenda, Catherine Shinazi. Did I pronounce that correct? Pronounce that oh, good. You're getting the tough news. Um, thank you. My name is Catherine Shinazi. Our family home is outside of Centerville. Um, and um, I understand you have my comments. Pull the micro microphone over to you. I understand you have my comments in your package. I didn't yes, realize that would happen, so I'm just going to make four uh, quick points. Um, the first is about the economic value of natural resources. Usually when we talk about protecting or conserving natural resources, we're talking about the environmental benefits, and those are certainly important. But I think it's also important to remember that there are dollars and cents benefits. And I've given you some examples how trees can help reduce energy costs, how riparian buffers can help reduce flooding costs, how um, just being in nature helps health, mental, and physical well-being of individuals, which reduce health care costs. So I just want to make sure that the economic benefits are also explicitly recognized in the plan. Then the second um, has to do with some inconsistencies among chapters. I understand that Wallace Montgomery is doing a, a job to try and integrate a lot of difficult uh, issues together to make one cohesive um, uh, argument about what the plan should look like. But th I just brought one example to your attention in the economic development chapter, chapter eight, where one of the strategies is to remove all the barriers for commercial development along Route 301 North. Um, that the Corsica River watershed actually goes to the east of 301, which is not always understood because the river seems so far away. But any commercial development there will affect negatively the, the, um, the watershed. It will also increase traffic. And if there's one thing that I've heard in listening to the sessions uh, for this plan, it's how bad traffic is. Um, so encouraging more traffic, particularly that truck traffic coming down from Delaware, is going to exacerbate some problems. And also, um, that kind of development is sprawl, and it goes against the town-centric kind of um, uh, model that you're seeing elsewhere in the plan. So I just want to point out that there are some inconsistencies. Um, we're still in a draft uh, situation. So I'm hoping that that can be um, addressed. Uh, the third point is about impervious surface. You've heard enough about that already, I think. Um, but I would just point out that the science, the literature says you start having problems at 5%. When you get to 10%, then there's really little that can be done. So I would ask that, you know, we think about it still difficult below that 10% threshold. And then finally, how do you know if we're being successful? Um, the requirement is that implementation plans be um, presented every year that the planning department sort of goes back and looks at the comprehensive plan and takes the recommendations and says, how did we do? I've tried to go through a number of those. Um, we don't have any for the last two years, but the five-year um, update is there and a number of the implementation plans. They're hard to get through, but more importantly, I think they don't necessarily reflect what is actually happening in the county since the comprehensive plan was put together. So the, time. the zoning and permitting decisions that are made are really a better measure of how well the vision and the plan is being implemented. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. If I can make a comment, Madam Chair, um, about the impervious uh, surface coverage, um, and please staff and DPW specifically weigh in on this, but 
with our MS4 permit, the stormwater permit that the state issues to the county, and we are a newly minted MS4 jurisdiction, part of that process is a tracking of impervious cover per watershed or per some jurisdiction, the jurisdictional boundary, and waste the allocations, the load allocations, the, 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 the pollution that runs off of those impervious servers. That is something that uh, the Department of Public Works is now sort of tracking. They're in the, you know, in the early stages of that and getting up to speed on that. But I would imagine that it's not a great leap, um, certainly with the sophistication and growth of the county's GIS systems and staff. These types of data should be more readily available and accessible as we move toward that next phase. Steve, can you agree or disagree or adjust that comment? No, you're absolutely right. The um, the county's move is is an MS4 jurisdiction now, phase two MS4. Um, we are um, in the beginning stages of implementing the MS4, um, establishing what you know what needs to be done. A uh, part of that is mapping the impervious coverage in the urbanized area, and there is a restoration requirement to to reduce the amount of impervious coverage within the urbanized area. Um, there's set um, percentages that we need to work to reduce or um, treat. Uh, untreated um, stormwater running off that impervious. So uh, we're looking at that now. We're, we're mapping that out, and um, that that's part of what we're doing. But that specifically, that work being done is, is directed primarily, if not solely, to the MS4 boundaries, right? The areas beyond that, like the Corsica and, 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 and further north and east, are not necessarily subject at this point in time so because... We're focusing on MS4 requirements. Correct? So there, there's there's several components of the MS4. The impervious restoration requirement is specific to the urbanized area, but there's a lot of all the other requirements are countywide requirements. They're being applied countywide. Things like uh, mapping the outfalls for stormwater, um, the stormwater inspection program that's countywide. Um, the outfalls will need to be mapped countywide. That's a pretty big task. Um, that's something that um, will happen over time. Um, I mean, uh, good sorry. housekeeping reports for county facilities is another component of the um, of, of MS4. Public outreach is countywide uh, for and, the and MS4. Steve, when you say countywide, does that include the uh, um, incorporated municipalities as well, or is it simply county, um, not Centerville, Queenstown? It, it's the county jurisdiction. Is uh, we the county? It's our, our boundaries and our properties, which some of them are in the town, are subject to the MS4 permit. But the towns don't necessarily have to, aren't being captured necessarily by county investigations toward the MS4. Did, is that clear? I believe that's correct. Okay, thank you. I, I, I need to confirm I that. But but be. but but we are the um, the the county government. The county jurisdiction is the one subject to the permit. Okay. And that includes county properties within the towns. Correct. Right. Okay, understood. Thank you. Yep. Didn't, that situation did not come without a fight from the county that ended up in the Court of Appeals or Court of Special Appeals. I'm not sure which. Okay, next on the agenda, Howard Dean. Good morning. A coalition of Queen Anne's County farmers have joined in a statement petitioning the county to commit strongly to farmland preservation in a 2021 comprehensive plan update. <clears throat> the statement has so far seen endorsed, has been endorsed by more than over 100 farmers that are actively farming. The statement leads off by reiterating support for the 2010 comp plan's vision of the county. Maintain the county's position as the state's largest grain producing county with the highest yields. Support all farmland preservation programs inc including rural legacy, mouth, and county supported programs. Designate Route 301 from Queenstown to Millington as a county scenic agriculture byway protected from commercial and residential development. Direct residential and commercial products to projects toward the towns with assurances of compatibility with their sur 
excuse me, its surroundings and the necessary infrastructure so as not to overburden county services, leading to increased taxes for the, all residents. Agriculture represents the largest economic sector in the county, over $180 million, with $130 million of expenses. We need to preserve as much farmland as possible to keep it productive for the future and maintain a critical mass of ag support businesses. We, we never get back. When we lose farms to residential and commercial development, we never get them back. And when things go far enough in that direction, the whole ag sector collapses. We want the comp plan to update to recognize these facts and reaffirm our commitment to preserving by every means practical the rural and agriculture character of Queen Anne's County. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Mr. Fostad. If I could be added to that list, I apologize, my Madam Chair. I didn't see the sign up sheet, but I would like to say a few things. If we might make an exception. We'll that see. Would be, that, would be, that would be last and least. We like, <laughs> let the clashes <laughs> Mr. Falstead. Good morning, everyone. Jay Falstead, Executive Director of Queen Anne's Conservation Association. It's nice to see everyone without a mask. And um, I just want to start off by recognizing Commissioner Jackson. He was good enough to set up a meeting at the Southersville um, Fire Hall last week um, and be able to bring in people from the north part of the county who have connectivity challenges, including myself. And uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, I just want to state a couple of things <laughs> that are obvious for those of us that drive around, um, but I th think they need to be repeated. Um, I was looking at Google Earth the other day, something that I encourage everybody to do. And if you put a pinpoint on Centerville or wherever it is that you live, and draw, use the ruler function and draw it out to places like Baltimore, places like Washington, Wilmington. Baltimore is 31 miles in that direction, just 31 miles. Washington, D.C. is just under 60 as the crow flies. Wilmington is about the same, 60 miles to the north. Philadelphia beyond that, Dover, growth and development is pressuring our area from all sides, and we all know it. Um, but if you look at what that growth and development does, just look at Ken Island. Increased impervious surfaces, schools are at capacity, pollution is increased. You drive down Route 50, you can see all of the pollution, all of the littering on the side of the roads. People are trying to keep up with it. I say this because if you look just 30 miles to the west are one of the most crime-ridden cities in the country. It's knocking at our doorstep. What we have here is so unique. It is the star-spangled America that we all see on the television commercials. It's the Paul Harvey commercial talking about farmers. What we have here is what everybody else wants. And we need to do whatever we can to protect it because as some of the other speakers have said, once it's lost, it is lost. We cannot get it back. And so I encourage this commission to take heed to what some of the previous speakers have said because we can really mess it up in short order and it's all in your hands. Um, and so anyway, thank you for the time and um, appreciate your service to the county. Thank you, Jane. I think we can make we can make an exception. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have to introduce yourself because no one knows you. <laughs> no, Madam. Madam Chair, your committee members, uh, staff, Scott McGlashan, uh, Churchill, Maryland, Parson Green Farm, and uh, matter of fact, I know most of most of you. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to echo uh, what uh, Howard Dean said, but but I wanted to point out to you, Howard Dean is a production agriculture farmer. Uh, I'm not. I was involved in agriculture through Kingstown Tractor, born and raised on a dairy farm, uh, Kingstown Tractor, uh, selling farm machinery, 
and got in something called a little bit of politics and then uh, retired and now working for my brother-in-law over 900 acres organic farming. So that's where we go in with, with a plow and a disc. We don't use herbicides, insecticides. But, um, but I wanted to point out that uh, last night I had the, the, the great thrill to meet a, a new farmer in Queen Anne's County. And uh, many of you know uh, Bill Riggs was a previous commissioner here in Queen Anne's County. His father was very active in Queen Anne's County. And But I met Trent Riggs last night, the young farmer that has now purchased what we call the part of the K-Hall farm, or what you might know as Casanelli's winery up there. And um, that was kind of a little un- unhappy situation. Uh, that's something I'd, I'd like to work on. I'd like to see this committee work on. There are 35 ag uses to the zoning ordinance, and we had a situation there that they wanted to put a conference center there. So they wanted to, 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 to utilize the zoning ordinance in a way that I think it wasn't intended to be used. Um, like Howard said, um, and I heard a previous gentleman say, and I thought about uh, my good friend, His Honor Judge South, uh, I would say to you, don't let the camel get his nose under this tent, because if you do, we're going to lose it. And the 301 quarter, I think, is important. 213 is a scenic highway also. And uh, But the thing I found when we went around and we got over these 100 signatures, not only did, did I go out physically and Howard went out physically and talked to people, not only production agriculture people, but people who own land. But surprisingly, I found out that there were people that don't own land, but they said to me, I'd like to sign your vision statement because we believe in preserving agriculture. That's why we're here. That's why we want to stay here. And as was pointed out earlier, unhappily, when we all turn the TV on, we see what's happening just across Chesapeake Bay. It breaks my heart to see what's going on also in this nation. Um, the, I was closed by saying this. Some number of years ago, Frank Craddeville had Doug Gansler uh, in the county, and he wanted to have a little meeting. And he was getting ready to go down to DPI, Delmarva Poultry Industry Convention in Salisbury. And he says, is there anything I should know? And I was invited, and I said, I, and of course, Doug was also clerk's of court attorney. And I, and I said, Doug, be careful how much pressure you're putting on these integrators, the Purdue's and the Tysons. I said, because I said, you do realize that we live in a corn deficit area on Delmarva. Unhappily, he said, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, Doug, we can't grow enough corn on Delmar to provide the poultry industry. That's the farmer's market. That's what prevents farmers this thing. People say farmers don't make money. Well, you talk to farmers, they'll tell you that. But, folks, they're making money. They're making money. Hard work, but they're making money. And they'll continue to make money, and they'll continue to farm as long as they can t- continue to have their farmland there. So, um, like I say, don't let the camel get his nose under this tent. The gentleman before me also said, I think the, what we've got currently is pretty damn close to being good. But uh, these 35 other ancillary uses of agriculture in the zoning ordinance, I think they should be looked at because to put a conference center up in the middle of where we were was absolutely flat wrong. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you allowing me to testify. We heard you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you have a Zoom comment? You do? Yep. Okay. So uh, we're going to hear from Annie Richards. Annie, I'm asking you to unmute now, please. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I'm Annie Richards, Chester River Keeper with Shore Rivers. And as an organization with 3,500 members, I can say that the people of Queen Anne's County and of the Eastern Shore value our waterways and the environment. And we want to see it protected and available to the public at all costs. Many who are familiar with past comprehensive plans see a disparity between the county's vision and the development projects approved. And so is my hope that the commissioners adopt strengthened implementation plans and accountability measures to help ensure that our vision, both past and as we build towards a future vision, align with our implementation strategies. Uh, I meet more and more people every day in my role as river keeper who have uprooted their families from DC, Philly, Baltimore to live full time on the Eastern Shore in the wake of COVID. And I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the wake of COVID. Um, as Catherine mentioned in her comments, 
our rural character and our natural resources and the open space that the Eastern Shore provides is a huge economic value and is a huge lifestyle value to those who live here and those who now wish to live here. Um, so I you know, urge the commission to continue to value that and allow that to drive our economic growth as well as you know, making it more publicly accessible to uh, our residents who already live here. And you'll find in your packet uh, some written comments I've submitted uh, in reference to increasing our public access and increasing connectivity between public access, particularly to the waterways that flow through Queen Anne's County. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other public comments? That's all. Okay. So uh, I want to thank Wallace and Montgomery. Lauren, you guys have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank um, you. Keep up the good work. Any other comments or? I'd like to make one, and that's it, I it's an want to make a motion. <laughs> it's an encouraging one. So I'd like to end on, end on a positive note. Um, is that through the written and oral testimony today and, and beyond at a lot of these uh, workshops and the online uh, presentation that uh, Wallace and Montgomery have conducted, there's a lot of synergy. There's a lot of, a lot of positive momentum in a similar direction uh, from groups and individuals that don't always align, uh, and, and that's to our benefit. Um, and and the, the, the places where there's divergence, I think there's certainly opportunity for discourse and, and problem problem solving at a, at a respectful level. Um, so I'm encouraged by that. And we talked a lot about the economies of, of agriculture, right? The number one economy in the county. I, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that not a lot of people understand what the number two is. It's hunting and fishing, right? Which is often very similarly clothed, uh, uh, cohabitates actually with the agricultural community, right? They're hunting in those farm fields in the wintertime. Where uh, fishing and hunting waterfowl on, on healthy waters. Uh, birds and geese don't come to unhealthy uh, habitat. Uh, so not only ag, but ag and its ripple effects in hunting and fishing and other ancillary uh, things like boat licenses and, and ramp fees and, and to, to the uh, Annie's point about inclusivity and, and, and exposure um, to those less fortunate than some of us that have direct water access. Uh, is important to keeping that resource at the front of people's minds. And if they're not exposed to it and don't appreciate it, they're going to have a hard time uh, paying utility fee or voting for something to, to protect those in the future. So I'm encouraged by the conversations that are often divergent uh, in this room and well beyond. So uh, I would like to thank uh, those of you who have provided either direct, indirect, or grab me by the collar and tap me on the shoulder in the grocery store. Um, and, and to Mr. Falstead's comment about it's, it's on us, it, it, the buck should stop up here, but I'm really encouraged by the level of participation in a, in a heavy lift environment of COVID and the challenges that Wallace Montgomery faced with getting people. Again, I'd like to applaud uh, Commissioner Jackson's and the, the North County folks who turned out in mass. Uh, you said 50 people. I don't know what national number was. That's a, that's a pretty really hefty a number turnout. in a good year. A good um, so I'm glad and, and appreciate the county, uh, specifically Director Mordock, for, for taking those challenges and those uh, uh, requests to heart and, and, and pushing that uh, and, and adopting, adapting uh, to that circumstance. So again, I'm starting to babble, but um, I'm pleased. Um, and Madam Chair, thank you for the chair time. You're, you're welcome. Now. Is anyone up here have just, a motion? Just a quick question. Do we have a list of the 35 items that aren't believed to be part of the agricultural community that are in the zoning? Uh, yes, sir. I, that would be helpful. I think it's in one and of our books. It's, it's in the zoning code. So just look at the permitted uses and conditional uses. So that's the list that he's referring to. Now, I'd, I'd like to know the ones he doesn't think belong on the list, I guess. I mean, I, 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 and, and as a study that should be done, uh, I would participate in everything. That's part of doing that. That's not a part of us, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I get a motion? So moved. <laughs> I'm looking this way because I can't get it down there. I'm, we adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs>